I acted like I was angry with myself for not remembering it. But I know for a fact that I was relieved. I didn't want to ask him. I was frightened by it. And so within a few days, I'd forgotten all about it. But I called him up, and I made an appointment to go see him like the, week, the weekend afterwards. And Ray and I decided to go down and visit him in, in West Virginia. And so we, we started down at Interstate 79 going towards, towards Wheeling. And I want to read you something. Um, but Steve Shriver, the other guy, the third guy that went with us to the lecture, didn't want to go. And he never wanted to talk about Rose after that. He never wanted to see him again. And uh, Steve was a real close friend of mine. And I lost track of him for 30 years. And when I got back in touch with him through a mutual friend and email just a few years ago, I, I couldn't help it. I said, what did you think about, what do you remember about that first lecture with Rose and all that? And he said, he, he wrote back and he said, we went downtown to a crowded hall with green folding chairs. Parentheses, how's that for memory? Where a tiny Indian man struck a chime and said, Mr. Reacher the Rose. Mr. Rose was frightening. So much so that even though I knew what he said was critically important to my life, I put it out of my mind. I'm not sure what happened next, but one morning I woke up to find a wife, four kids, a house, and a minivan that apparently all belonged to me. The rest, as they say, is history. That's what Steve wrote for me. Um, so we headed down to West Virginia. We pulled into Wheeling. We, Rose lived in Benwood, West Virginia, a little coal town, a little tiny wedged against the mountain next to the Ohio River. We pulled into this parking lot in this, in this blackened junior high across the street from where, where he told us to, from his house where he told us to park. And we look over and we see this completely dilapidated looking house uh, over top of a storefront, a sagging, needed a coat of paint and just about everything else. And it was hot as hell. It was July or something like that. It was hundreds of degrees. Of course, this race car didn't have any air conditioning. But we sat there just staring. It was really depressing. So finally, we got out and um, we went over and we walked up the steps and knocked on the door. And the first thing happened is this door opens and a woman about 40 or so sticks and says, what do you want? And we were really taken aback. And she says, I said, we're here to see Richard Rose. Is he here? No, he went to sell a car. But you can come in and wait if you want. So he brings us in and brings, she sits us in this room, shuts the door. There's, the windows are all locked, closed. It's 100 degrees in there. There's no light except that it's just kind of all the curtains are keeping all the light out. And we're just sitting there. And I remember there was a clock ticking on the wall. On the, on the mantelpiece, and that was it. So I turned to Rose and Ray, and I said, Ray, I said, um, who do you think that was, the landlady? He said, if it was, she was a couple months behind on the rent. a couple months behind on the rent. But I looked around, and there was books open, and a, a writing table, and a bed, and everything. It looked like, a, like some crank guy that would rent a room in a rooming house and spend all day long writing letters to the electric company telling them they're giving them cancer or something. Um, <laughs> so, we, so we sat there. And suddenly, now we weren't there about 10 minutes or so, we the door bursts open, and there's Rose. He says, the hell you say? When'd you get in? <clears throat> and we told him we'd been there for about 20 minutes or so. And I said, um, your landlady let us in. He says, hell, that's no landlady, that's my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember being really, really disappointed, you know. Zen masters were, I could handle the crank, you know, that would be cool. But uh, now you can't be married, you know. Um, <laughs> but he's got this long sleeve, uh, um, he's got an undershirt on or a t-shirt, and over top of it he's got one of his lumberjack shirts, and it's all buttoned up pretty much except for the top button, long sleeve, it's 100 degrees, he sits down and he starts rattling on about philosophy and Zen and everything about 10, and I'm thinking, we're just dying, the sweat's just pouring off of this, like, but just as I was about giving up on getting out of there alive, he says, what do you say we go out to the farm? I'm like, wow, farm, that's something I like it. He said, we can get away from, the, from my kids, you know, I got a 17 year old son, he's driving me crazy. <coughs> And so we go out in the kitchen, he introduces us to his wife. She turned out to be a very affable woman and um, about 15 years younger than him. But, um, and he had three, it turned out he had three kids. And uh, so he just announces he's going to take us out to the farm. So he says, well, we better pack a lunch. So he goes in there and he reaches out. Now, you guys have probably heard of Velveeta, a uh, bar of cheese. Well, Rose pulls out this thing that's called Chef's Delight, which in comparison, <laughs> is like, Velveeta is a delicacy. I mean, it's like the greatest cheese you've ever had. 
<laughs> and he takes this chef's delight out, then he takes a loaf of day old bread, and he takes a butcher knife, and he takes big wedges of this block of this cheese, folds them into a, a single sheet of paper, wraps them in, um, not saran wrap, but um, wax paper, which I, even at that time I had to see people my mother used for years, and I sticks them in a bag, and that was lunch. There were about six or seven of these half sandwiches wrapped in this, this stuff. I'll never forget. He put it in a, a big brown paper bag too, and rolled it up. So we headed out. We go across the street. I decided to drive with him, and Ray was going to follow us out so we could go straight back to Pittsburgh. And he fires up this 1962 um, Buick with the muffler shot and, and everything. And we take off like a bat out of hell, driving these big mountains and everything. And we finally come up to this jungle place of, of a farm. He had 186 acres out in the woods on this ridge. This family had owned for generations. And, and there was all kinds of, it was just like you would expect in West Virginia. You know, refri dead refrigerators on the, and, on, and stoves on the, on the uh, porch of the, of the house, and, and uh, uh, junk cars everywhere you looked. And there was even a, a sawmill that was covered with briars and stuff, because he was actually, at one point, had, had a car hooked up to it. And he was using it as a, he was using the, he had a strap around the uh, wheel of the car to be able to turn the sawmill. <coughs> So he then he goes over to a trailer. He had the house rented, so he opens his trailer, and it's this little tiny trailer out in the sun with no shade to it. And he goes in there, and we start talking more about philosophy and everything. And suddenly he says, what? And we're just dying. And he suddenly says, come on, let's take a walk around the farm. And uh, when he left, he closes the door, and he leaves the cheese sandwiches in there. And I thought, man, that's one thing, no matter how hungry, how long this walk is, there's no way I've eaten those cheese sandwiches. <laughs> And uh, so we start, and he walks us all over this farm, up and down. He was in his mid-50s or late-50s at that time. We were 20, and he was walking us to death, because everything in West Virginia is like this. And uh, through briars and brambles, if you wanted to see something, he didn't look for the trail, he just went straight through it. Meanwhile, he was always telling you about this is mayapple, and this is ginseng, and this is, this is this kind of rock, and this is that kind of rock. He was a real naturalist as well. But after a... Um, a long walk, we came to this spring, and there was a spring house there, and there was some chairs and stuff we could sit down on, and we had some cool water. And, we're, and, and the view went down into this valley, and there was a dairy farm way down below. It was just really beautiful, because the spring had made a rivulet, a ridge going down the ridge, kind of a valley, so you could see through the trees. We're sitting there, and we got quiet just watching it. And I started toying with the idea that I could be his student. I'm sitting there toying with it, but I'm still hesitant. Suddenly, Rose just says, Apparently to no one, he says, you know, if I ever met anyone who wanted the truth more than anything else, I would drop any, everything in my life to help that person. Boom! Did he read my mind? <laughs> Possible. You know, and I'm sitting there, and again, I'm kind of reeling at that same feeling I had outside of the, of the lecture. Before I know it, he and Ray are already walking down this logging trail. So I have to catch up with him. After that, I don't remember anything except my mind just spinning. And it was spinning around two things. One was how fascinated I was with this grunt rose, and the other was the realization that this guy was not playing around. This is full tilt boogie. This is all in, hang it all out. This guy was not, you know, um, because, and all of a sudden, all this disenchantment that I had with my normal life wasn't so disenchanted. As the Bible says, things didn't look so bad back in Egypt suddenly. <laughs> I had all this stuff going for me, and all of a sudden I realized that my attitude towards spirituality and Zen, to a large extent, was that spirituality was supposed to be an addition to my normal life, it's supposed to smooth out the, rigid, the ripples a little bit. <clears throat> it was supposed to make every, you know, be that icing on the cake, so the chicks would dig me even more. <laughs> and all of a sudden, Rose is talking about pulling my life up by the roots, or at least it felt like that, even though it said not said anything to me directly. And so I'm spinning and spinning and spinning. And when I came out of this thinking, you know, I had all this going for me and Russian history and everything. And when I started walking down the, the stream, come up where I, by the stream, and Rose says, I think if we just cut through here, we'll come out right at the farmhouse again. And man, he leads us up this almost vertical cliff through all these briars and brambles and the sweat's pouring down. And I made up my mind that I had to ask him about this. I had to ask him about this. So we finally got back and, and we, were, we were just about ready to leave. And I probably screwed up my courage, and I said, Mr. Rose, I said, I've got to ask you a question. I said, this is really, you know, in the 
the vernacular of the day. This is really far out. <laughs> this is really cool, the stuff you're talking about. I'm really fascinated. But I've got a problem. You know, I'm doing all this. I'm talking about my studies and my work, and my family is counting on me, and I'm supposed to do this, and I'm supposed to go into politics and help people mm -hmm. eventually, and all this stuff after I do all this stuff. And, and I said, here's my problem. I said, you're, you know, you feel this, you're, this is a full tilt boogie kind of thing you're talking about. I, don't, I said, I don't know how I can put these two things together because I really want to help people. And I don't see how I can do this with, uh, with what you're talking about. So uh, he listened very sympathetically, and then he reaches down, he picks up a little piece of grass, and he starts chewing on it. He said, well, since you asked me, and I like you, he says, I'll tell you what I think. You don't give a damn about anybody else in the whole world except yourself. He said, it's not enough that your family loves you and your friends love you. He says, no, you're not going to be content until the whole damn world loves you. He said, when I look at you, I see a cock on a woodpile crowing to the heads. Now, I'll tell you, he said, believe me, he said, if that's what you want, I'm not going to stand in your way. He says, you're a pretty smart guy. Maybe you'll pull it off. He says, but please, <coughs> don't be coming down here handing me that bullshit. And kaboom! My knees just, just buckled. And I really didn't do him justice because I put much more emphasis. What really made his, his speech so devastating was it was completely natural, nonchalant. You know, for what it's worth, you're an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I remember there was three thoughts that were competing in my brain. My brain was like on a hinge. And it was the first thought was, um, how did he know? It's true. How did he know? I didn't know. Yes, I always know. So there's four thoughts. It's true. How did he know? I didn't even know. Yes, you always knew. And I don't even remember getting the hell out of there. But when I got back to Pittsburgh, I spent two weeks planning this murder. <laughs> I was furious. I was so angry. You know, the nerve of that guy to say that to me. How could he do that, you know? Uh, my mother loves me. And I'm the firstborn. But gradually, I just could not get it out of my head that everything he had said about me was absolutely the truth. That I was a complete fraud. And so finally, you know, like a meek lamb, I just pick up the phone one day and I call him up and I say, Mr. Rose, I'd like to come to see you again. He said, sure, come on down. So I ended up going back down to, uh, to see him. And, uh, um, and for the next couple of months, I spent a lot of time arguing with him all the time. But anyway, I want to sp speed this up. So eventually we started a group at the, at the University of Pittsburgh. And Rose volunteered to come up every every. Uh, every week. And for a few weeks the thing went along well and uh, we had a lot of college students coming and then all of a sudden we show up one. We had a treasurer and a secretary and this treasurer whose name is Nancy and Rose shows up and starts to leave the meeting and this woman, this girl sticks up her hand and says, we want to learn Kung Fu. <laughs> and because that show Kung Fu it was, it was on at that time. And Miss Rose says, well I don't teach Kung Fu. And she says, well we got together and we want to Learn Kung Fu. And Rose says, I don't teach Kung Fu. Now, I was the president. I didn't know anything about this meeting where they got together to decide on Kung Fu. They didn't bring it up to me. Um, and so Rose says, well, if that's what your decision is, then I'll be on my way. And they said, they said, fine, we're going Kung Fu. So Mr. Rose picks up his satchel and he heads for the door. And I was sitting right where Ian is. Just as he passed me, I jumped up. And I was the only one in the whole room. There was about 30 people there that left uh, with Rose. And I was devastated because, like Ian, I put up thousands of posters. I've done all this stuff. I, I put Rose, two lectures on for Rose and everything. Built this thing all up over the last few months, and suddenly the whole thing. So I'm really dejected. I'm walking down there, and he said, "I said to Mr. Rose, I said, looks like we lost the group, Mr. Rose." And he says, "Why would you say that? You're here. What else matters?" He said, "The only thing that matters is sincerity. If you're sincere." Let everything else take care of itself. So I thought he was kind of just giving me some double talk. So we ended up going back to my apartment. I lived in a house with some other guys, and nobody was home. So I started making some tea, and he wanted to talk about what our next plans were going to be or what we were going to do next. 
and suddenly there's a knock on the door. And I go to the door, and three or four people were there from the group, and they said, is Rose here? Can we come in? And then the door knocked again, and then the door knocked again, and 28 out of the 30 people that were in that room that one night showed up at my house. And to this day, I don't know how they knew where I lived. So I'm making all this tea, and when I sat down, when we sat down and Rose was started talking to all these people, he just kind of glanced over me and gave me this little smile. It was like, oh, you have little faith. You know, and I got another one of those surging jolts. Well, a lot of other things happened, but I want to speed the story up for you guys and just tell you one more uh, thing that happened in the wintertime. I used to lay carpet for a living as a way of making money. And the theme that I'm trying to get across here, I hope I'm doing a pretty good job, is there's this, this scary, frightening idea that there's something going on in the background here. That something is manipulating events, that I'm being sucked into something. And I'm, this, I'm going into this rabbit hole, and it's, and it's you know, and every time I caught myself saying, oh, wow, man, this rose is up to this, he's, man, what are you doing, you know? Next thing you know, you're going to be talking to the television set. <laughs> so on the one hand, you're desperate, you're working with this teacher, you desperately want to believe in miracles, you desperately want to see miracles, and then anything that might smack of a miracle, if you find yourself starting to think it might be possible, then you start, whoa, I start going down that road, where does it end? So anyway, I'm doing this, uh, me and my brother pull up at like 5 o'clock on, on a winter's day, and it's cold, and it's getting dark, and, and we're running late, it's the last carpet job of the day, it was a weekend, and it's this big old house in one of the fancier sections of Pittsburgh, and there was all kinds of, the whole yard was in disrepair, leaves all over the place. But that wasn't very surprising to me because when you lay carpet, you find out people do the inside of the house when they move in, and then put the carpet in last, then they do the outside of the house later. So we get out, and we go up, and I knock on the door, and this guy comes to the door. He's all alone. He's the owner of the house, and he's a real smarmy, greasy kind of guy. I didn't like him instantly. Um, and he turned out to be from uh, Czechoslovakia, and he just started talking about how much money he had and how much he made good in the United States. And, he insisted on taking us on a tour of his house, and we were, ooh, ah, ooh, ah. It was obvious that was what our job was, when we only didn't want to get to work. And um, so we went, I went through it, and we did that customer satisfaction kind of stuff. So we finally started going to work. And finally I got, my brother was putting the strip and pad, and he would move on to the next room, and I would come in behind him, and I came into this library. This library was immense, it was probably at least a quarter of the size of this, this room. And it was, all that was in it was a, was a grandfather clock. And the clock was ticking, and there was hardly any light in the place, just one chandelier. <clears throat> My brother had spread out the carpet, so I started going to work. But I had this uh, bad habit when I got into people's houses to start looking at their books. I love books, and I just started, I would just start poking around with their books. And uh, so I'm reading, I'm looking at this guy's book collection, and suddenly I see this whole section on spiritual stuff. Not just spiritual stuff like Zen, but, but what, we, what Rose used to call the occult. Things like Madame Blavatsky and... And, and people like that. Um, and suddenly I see this book, it's called Isis Unveiled. And I remember Rose telling me that when he was a young man, he had been reading this book, Madame Blavatsky, and Isis Unveiled. And he used to take, when he was on his own quest, he used to go out into the, he bought a farm, he traveled around the country, um, working in different cities because he didn't want to come get the mentality of the locals. So he traveled all the time, and he sent money back and he bought a farm. Um, beside the one that his family owned, and he used to spend two months a year out there in the wintertime in isolation in a house that didn't have any running water or anything, and he would just sit and read and <clears throat> you know, eat, eat beans and, and meditate and pray all the time. So I started, I picked up this book, it was this old, old book, and um, so I opened it up and I started reading it. And the, and the book, it was all about this, you know, occult kind of stuff. So when the when the, when, the, when, the, when the angels of this come in contact with the person of power, then they realize that, they, you know, but it was, there was something cool about it, too. It was like reading something out of Star Wars. So I'm reading it, I start reading it aloud, not realizing it, when suddenly I hear a voice right in my ear say, are you interested in the spirit of God in man? It was the most important thing in my life. He said, but then I got busy. He said, there were jobs, there was wife, there was kids, there was, as he even said, dry cleaning tickets, pampers, and plans for dinner. He said, in some way, I, somewhere along the line, I lost my way. And now it's too late for me. It's too late for me. 
and his tears started running down his face. And suddenly he realized what he was doing, and he just whirled around, boom, he was gone. So I put the book back, it's a very scary little sit scenario, and I started, started finishing, and never saw him again until we finished. So I had to go find him, and he had to sign the work order, so we, we walked around, now he was all business again, checking each room, <laughs> Finally, <clears throat> signs the work order. My brother's cleaning up. We're picking up the tools. We're leaving. I'm walk, almost walking out the door. I feel a tap on my shoulder. I turn around. There he is again. He said, I want you to do, he said, I want you to have this. He hands me the book, Isis Unveiled, the hardback copy. And I reached out to it. And I took hold of it, but he didn't let go of it. And he said, but I want you to promise me something. Promise me. And I said, I just nodded. I said, yeah, well, what is it? He said, Promise me you'll do more with it than I did. Promise me you'll never forget. And so I just nodded at him. The next thing I knew, I was in the car, in our truck, my brother's driving, and, and, uh, and I'm shaking like a leaf. And he turns to me and he says, are you all right? And I said, yeah, I'm all right. But I wasn't all right. I was absolutely half convinced that if I wheeled that truck around and went back, that house would be gone that that man wouldn't be there anymore, and that the whole thing was set up for Rose to make a point. <laughs> and on the other hand, of course, I knew that was absolutely absurd and ridiculous. Real quickly, what happened was a couple weeks later, we're doing a job, and for, a, for an apartment job, on the other side of Pittsburgh, <coughs> and um, it was real small, so the husband and wife were jammed into this kitchenette, while we're laying carpet all around, and also the door opens, who comes in at the same guy? And he comes in and he most immediately starts talking to this couple and they were having some kind of dispute about the rent or something like that. So it wasn't a friendly conversation. And then suddenly I'm on my knees. I didn't say hello to him. He didn't say hello to me. And all of a sudden he's walking back out. And uh, as he walks by, he looks down at me and he taps me on the shoulder again. I look up like this from the floor. He says, you know, anyone, everyone I've ever met who was serious about this work had eyes just like yours. He walked out, and I've never seen him again. Uh, but I still have that book, and I, I wrote somewhere, I said, it's the most precious thing I have. And I think about him once in a while, and I think, you know, that he found the peace that he felt like he had lost. But moving uh, even more quickly, things like this just kept happening, and I was, but I never could bring myself to ask Rose about it. I was always afraid that, that and if I asked him about these things and about the experience, these little jolts of energy that I would get when I was hanging around with him, that somehow or another that would trigger one that was too big for me to handle. And of course this irritated me too, because I would think to myself, wait a second, you're coming to this guy to get something like that, and now it seems like it's there and you don't want it. So it was kind of a frustrating thing too. But finally he announces that he's going to invite us down to this, for the summer to his, um, oh, I've got to tell you one more, more quick story. Rose comes up to Pittsburgh one time, and uh, he got to do some research in the library, so I meet him early. And we come across the street to get a hamburger before the meeting. We had a meeting later that night with the college students. So we're, we're getting a hamburger, and, and, um, and we get involved in a discussion about philosophy as always, and we're deeply talking about it. <clears throat> when all of a sudden I hear a voice say, um, where'd you come from, old man? And I look up, I was really engrossed in this conversation. We were near the front of the table right by the street. I look up past Rose, and, the first, <coughs> and I see these five <coughs> kids all dressed up in glitter and, and, and lame outfits, and, and, you know, and their eyes are like Cleve lights. Obviously, they're tripping their brains out. <laughs> and a whole place is full of kids dressed like that. And suddenly it clicks on me, David Bowie's concerts tonight. <laughs> This is Ziggy Stardust, and all these kids are dressed up like Ziggy Stardust, and they're going to think, but Rose doesn't know that. Um, and this guy just said, had just picked Rose out at random and said, what are you, it was a big uh, curly haired guy, he had, four, had a girl and four guys with him, and he said, what are you doing here, old man? And uh, Rose is sitting there talking to me, and without even missing a beat, he looks up at the kid and he says, me? Just came from jail. <laughs> and the guy, he's shocked for that. So he looks around at these other guys and his kids are waiting. Come on, now what are you going to do? And he says, all right, well, what were you in jail for? He says, uh, were you drunk? <clears throat> and Rose, and Rose, without again, without hesitation, he says, uh, why? Hmm. Why never occurred to me? 
The what was more interesting than the why. Did I say jail? It was more like a hotel. A dream about a hotel, or more exactly, a hotel full of dreams. It was like a Waldorf a story of my dreams, but really it was the Waldorf a story of dreams. I was an indentured night clerk. You know, I kind of kept the key to each key. A hotel jailer in the jail, but not actually in jail. Anyway, I had a key to each room, and each room had a dreamer, and each room, each room was a dream, and each room contained a dreamer. Dreamers in a dream, you know. And I recognized each dreamer dreaming, each rumor dream, and do you know who they were? They were you, 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 and you. And these kids went, <laughs> and, and finally one kid, one, one, not the leader, but the other kid says, hey man, you're freaking us out. <laughs> and then the coolest thing though was the guy who had started all the trouble, the guy that's going to goof on roads for everybody's entertainment, he just goes, hey man, this guy knows something. <laughs> and he just sits right down next to Rose and he says, first thing out of his mouth, he says, what happens to you when you die? And they all sit down and the next thing I know, they're engaged in this incredible uh, conversation and, and it's like I'm not even there, nobody's paying any attention to me and they're going on and on. It goes on for about an hour or so and all of a sudden we have to go to the meeting. So we get up, and this, Rose has got her posse now. This whole entourage follows him down the street. They would get to the front of the student union, and I'm, I was behind. I didn't even know what they were saying anymore. They're slapping Rose on the back, and he's pumping her hands. <coughs> and Rose says, wait a second, before you go, I have, I have the truth for you. And I'll lean in like this, and he says, Hagamus, Hagamus. Woman's monogamous. Hagamus, Hagamus. Man is polygamous. <laughs> they go, ah! laughing their asses off and they, they walk on down the road so I caught up with Rose we went there and said the West Rose why did you invite me to meet the meeting he said hell they were blast on asses he said don't wake up tomorrow and forget that you existed um, I said what was that all about Mr. Rose I mean that whole that whole rap about the dreams of the hotel and everything and, and you're really trying to say that this world is kind of like that hotel and, and, and it's a dream itself and that we're in a dream world so we're inside the dream and I'm going on like that and he says he said, it's some of that, none of that, and bullshit besides. He said, you think that you're gonna, he says, he said, you think you're gonna figure it all out with that brain of yours. You're gonna parse it all out and figure it all out. He says, you're not. He said, I have a better idea. Just go there. Just go there. And then you won't have to ask me any of the stupid. So anyway, we headed down to Mr. Rose's farm for the summer. Some kids from, S from Kent State had already gotten interested in, so they came along. And some kids from Pitt, Ray was one of them, my friend Ray Kent. <clears throat> Me and Ray fixed up this 1963 Ford van that I bought from the, from the telephone company that was all busted up and we refurbished it so we could sleep in it. And then I decided that what I needed to make this thing absolutely perfect was a dog. So I went out and got a German Shepherd dog. I named him Dharma. Of course. Um, and so I got this dog, and we show up at Mr. Rose's uh, farm. And uh, the first day, Rose shows up, and he's talking to us and everything. And I'm expecting, you know, 7 o'clock, we're going to get up, and then we're going to meditate, and we're going to walk around in a circle, and we're going to stand on our heads, and we're going to eat light rice, only with chopsticks, by the way. <coughs> but he doesn't. He just talks to us, he answers some questions. <coughs> and then he just says, Well, I got to go back into town, because he lived in town on the farm. So he gets up, and he leaves. And I'm expecting, you know, well, we're all expecting he'll be back in the morning and we're going to stay off from there and we'll see, you know. One day goes by, no rose. Two days goes by, no rose. Three days goes by, no rose. Four days goes by, no rose. Five days goes by, no rose. It's 100 degrees out there. There's nothing to do. First circle day, days, we're meditating. We're, we're walking up by the fifth day. We're just climbing the freaking walls. So how do we get together? We've got to do something about it. Maybe he died. So, so all the guys, there were some girls or two, but all the guys jam into my truck and we tentatively drive into the to town, <laughs> go up to the town, and they push me to the front, I knock on the door, Rose comes to the door, and he says, hey, what can I do for you? <laughs> he says, uh, what's, what's going on, Mr. Rose? We haven't seen you for a week. And he said, uh, um, I said, we're going crazy. He says, good, that's what I had in mind. Now maybe I can get you to pay attention. <laughs> so the first thing he had us do was he had us tear down this house to build another, uh, that he owned in another part of the town, this old house for the lumber and the nails and everything so we could build a shed, uh, like a meeting room on his farm that we could have. <clears throat> and so he puts us to work on that. 
the very first day that we were there, there was, another, there was a guy, who was a school teacher, his name was Frank Mascara, and his wife came down with him, and he was 26, he was older, had a little bit of carpentry experience. <clears throat> so Mr. Rose kind of made him a foreman. So we show up for work the first day to tear this building down, and Frank calls me over, and he says, uh, Mr. Rose says you're not allowed on the roof. <clears throat> I said, why? He says, because you're always laughing and joking and cutting up and doing all kinds of stuff. Rose says you'll fall off, break your neck, and then you'll have to drive to Pittsburgh and tell your mother. <laughs> He says, you're, he says, what you're going to do is you're going to straighten nails, these old 150-year-old nails. Um, you're going to straighten them on all day long so we can revisit them. I am just utterly humiliated. I started this group. I was the leader. I was the first Rose's first student. You know, and I'm relegated to straighten nails. <clears throat> so at the end, as soon as we get off work that day, I jump in my van, drive over to Rose's house, knock on the door. Rose comes to the door. I said, Mr. Rose, it was some kind of incredible mistake. I mean, Frank said it. You know, that he doesn't want me on the roof and I got straight nails. He said, absolutely. He says, you're so busy. He said, I'm not making jokes and so distracted all the time. He says, you'll fall off the, the roof for sure, break your neck, and then I have to drive to Pittsburgh and tell your mother. <coughs> and, <coughs> so, so that was it for me, but I went back. And I like to say that I went back and I straightened those nails like, a, like it, my life depended on it. And eventually I earned the right to get up on some more important work. And to this day, I think that was one of the most important lessons that I ever learned. But I had other lessons to learn. Because what happened is, the as the time went on, I started taking advantage of my position and my ready wit and whatever else. And I started teasing a lot of the people. And he was from uh, Kent State University. And he was uh, Mother Earth News incarnate. I mean, he, he, he always had his, only, he, he was a vegan vegetarian. And, had long hair and he always wore his bandana, but it was an Indian leather bandana. I think he slept in it, and, and, um, and he was just um, the quintessential hippie. And so I'd always tease him. And, and one of the things I do is, is, is talk about how we're going to turn Mr. Rose's farm into a dirt motorcycle racetrack. And, and I would just keep going on and on about what this dirt motorcycle racetrack was going to be, and not the smell of exhaust fumes and how fired up I got him until he would just get so pissed off he would just run away. Leave the, leave the campfire where we were eating, eating dinner. So one day Rose turns to me and he says, Phil Oscar was in to see me. I said, oh, what about Mr. Rose? He said, well, he says that, you know, that you're always, uh, um, that your dog is always um, barking all the time and making all kinds of noise. And I said, well, what'd you tell him, Mr. Rose? He said, I told him he's got to control his mind. He's got to be able to focus his brain. It doesn't matter whether there's distractions. And I, and I just nodded my head and I'm thinking, yeah. A little snitch, you go. Yeah. <laughs> and so then a couple of weeks or so later, he comes up and says, Bill Osmond was in to see me again. And I said, what? He says, you're always capping on people. You're always teasing people. You're always taking them in. I said, um, yeah, well, yeah. Well, what'd you tell him, Mr. Rez? He said, I told him I'm not running a convoy where every boat's got to go as slow as the slowest ship. I told him he's got to get smarter. He's got to get brighter. He's got to learn how to cap on you. I said, yeah, that's telling him, Mr. Rez. So meanwhile, we're working up on the top of the hill working on building this building for Rose, or the Rose wanted to turn into a meeting building, we are making some pretty good progress, and Rose would come out intermittently uh, to help, but at the final push, and we were on like two weeks from the end, he came out every day, because he actually was earning a living during that summer. He was a roofer and a painter, and that's how he made and sold cars, that's how he made his living. He had all these buses out of his barn, out of his farm, because he would buy buses for like 300, uh, old school bus. He would sell the tires and the wheels and the, and the undercarriage, and he would set them up on blocks, and use them for storage, you know, West Virginia pure. <laughs> and um, so he starts, he comes out, he takes some time off from his own work to come out and spend two weeks with us at the end. And the first day he comes out, he just turns to me and he just starts hammering. I mean, no matter what I said or what I didn't say, it was just slapping me around verbally. Um, and the thing that really hurt the most about it was Rose was really, really ready wit, really adroit. I mean, he was really funny. He was a great teaser himself. Uh, probably one of the reasons I loved him so much. And he made no effort with me to be subtle at all. It's, hey, idiot, get the hammer. Oh, oh, well, maybe we better get a smarter idiot. Because he doesn't know what a hammer is. I mean, that kind of stuff. <clears throat> Just constantly, constantly. So it goes through all of one day. And I get back there and I think, OK. I had it coming. I see what this is. This is payback for what I was doing to that asshole called Osgood. <laughs> you know, the, be the best thing to do is just get through it, 
you know, make it my man, and blah, 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 blah. But then there's the second day, and the third day, and the fourth day, and it's unstopping. Now I'm furious, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, maybe he wants me to take a swing at him. No, maybe that'll end our relationship. You know, no, I don't want to give him the benefit of the doubt of showing him how upset I am. But what do you mean? You came all the way down here to talk to the man, and now you want to hide your emotions from him? Why don't you just go home? That's what he wants me to do. I'm not going home. <clears throat> and, this, and this thing got more and more and more intense until my mind became just wrapped so tight that I couldn't think of anything but the pain and the anguish that I was with and what, how I could get out of this box that I was in. And um, it kind of reminds me of a, a house episode where, where one, of the, one of House's uh, underlings, one of the doctors, is, is really fed up with House and, and he turns to the other one and he says, you know, House, I'm sick and tired. He said, House is playing this game. He's playing another one of his damn games. He said, uh, and he's got it scripted so that every one of us is playing our roles. He said, I am fed up with it. He said, I am not going to play this game. And, and the other guy turned and says, that's just what House is counting on. This, the part you're supposed to play in his game is the guy who refuses to play his game. And all these things were twisting in on my mind until it got really, really intense. And then one night, you know, I was, plus, of course, it was one of those things probably wasn't literally true, but it felt that way. I became a pariah to everybody else living at the farm. I mean, I was in this dark depression, dark space, and they were kind of staying away from me. I, nobody was talking to me, or it seemed that way to me. Um, so finally one night, uh, I'm just in such a terrible state. I get my dog, Dharma. He's my only friend, the only person I can count on. And I decided to go for a walk in the dark, you know, as it's getting dusk. And we go for a walk, and I, and I sit down, and I go immediately dog runs away, and I immediately sit down and go into this stupor about what am I going to do, and why is he doing this to me, and <clears throat> it's not fair, and all this stuff. When suddenly, you know, um, I hear the dog coming through, so I whistle for the dog, and he comes, starts running through, and he starts jumping on me, and, and as he jumps on me, he smears me with human excrement. <laughs> what I had forgotten was that, you know, um, we, Rose had us going to the bathroom on top of the ground uh, towards this one section of the farm because he didn't want to get contaminate the well water and all that kind of good stuff. So we were throwing some dirt over it, you know what I mean? Anyway, the dog got into it. He was covered with it. Then he smeared it all over me because I didn't see him in the dark. And now I've got to go back and face these people back at, this, at the campfire and get a change of clothes, go to the spring. The little spring is the only place you can wash. And this is just an absolute bitter end. And when I come back, you know, of course, I'm like, oh, oh, I got here. And but the worst thing was is I realized that somebody's going to tell Rose. <laughs> somebody's going to tell Rose. So the very next day, we get the, get the word, come into town. So we go into, um, we go into town the next day, and we're sitting around. And as soon as we get all around this kitchen table, he starts in. He says, here I was, thinking that I was the Zen master. He says, I have to apologize to you people. I've been deceiving you all along. He says, the real Zen master is that dog, Dharma. <laughs> he says, because when you think about it, he said, Zen is not a thing that you use words for. You, you go directly to the heart of the matter. You do it in a symbolic way, with a direct signal. He said, and what better way to unveil all these characters than to smear them with you know what? He said, that's, he says, the dog is, you know, he has, he has, on the other hand, the dog only has this as a defense mechanism. You and I, the rest of us, we can walk, get away from his BS. But the dog can't. The only way the dog can get across to him that he's sick and tired of it is to smear him with it. I mean, <laughs> on and on. On. And the other people there, <clears throat> for a while, they tried to uh, laugh along. But gradually they couldn't either. And it was just, the tension was just unbelievably bad. And at just at the point, though, when I thought, I, I just can't take any more of this, he just stopped. And we went back to the farm. He came out the very next day. And he, he greeted me like nothing had ever happened between us. It was completely friendly and everything. My ordeal was over. A couple weeks after that, uh, we were just we were, we were getting towards the end of the summer. It was time to go back to school. And one goal that I'd had for that whole summer thing was to ask Rose about these little experiences that I was having with him. And I had not been able to get the courage of him. So one day we're again in that same kitchen and we're sitting around. And um, Rose is, uh, is 
very casual. Rose is cracking jokes, is telling stories. Great storyteller. And uh, I thought, this is my chance. Tension is real, everything is real funny, relaxed, everything. I can ask him a question and get away with it. The last minute, though, I lost my nerve, so I asked him a question, kind of one of those questions, like, I have this friend that has this problem. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I said, Mr. Rose, I said, sometimes I think that if I just relaxed, something might happen to me. And suddenly he whirled around and he said, yes, but you'd have to cry. And Augie doesn't cry, now, does he? And this turned out to be, I, ha I never even thought about it, but I had to cry since I was like nine years old. And, I, you know, and it was so, so common to me that it never even occurred to me that that was. But as soon as he said that, that revelation, him putting his finger right on that, it was boom. It was like a, just a huge bolt of energy hit me between the eyes. And the next thing I know, my mind started to reel. And the best way that I can describe what was happening to my mind was <clears throat> imagine that you're just, you're, you're getting really stunned. Something happens to you that just really stuns you. And then the very next thing that happens is you become stunned at how stunned you are. And then you're stunned at how stunned at how stunned you are. Then stunned is and stunned and stunning and stunning and stunning and stunning and stunning. <clears throat> so that there's no chance to get your feet under you. No chance to think. Just real. Mm, mm, mm. And it was faster and faster and faster. And the only thing that I recall during that was terror. Just absolute terror. I didn't know where this was going. I was just, oh, oh, oh. I mean, it was, if I could have screamed, I think I would have screamed. But it was happening so fast and so intense that I was just, I was just locked. And you know, I don't know how long it lasted, but I got to a point where suddenly, um, you know, my mind, my mind got detached from itself, and I saw, saw these thoughts, my mind going in front of me. And this was more stunning because if that's my thoughts over there, who the hell's watching? Who's, who's experiencing you know? And that was really, really scary. And at that moment, I suddenly had, <clears throat> it was like I was traveling at the speed of light and I was in this completely, I don't know, there was no space or time or anything. It was just, I don't know where it was. But it was kind of like a place. And suddenly I realized that I was being offered the opportunity, it's the best way I can put it, to see myself as I really was truly see myself. And uh, all I had to do was tilt my mind's eye. I was look out of the corner of my mind's eye, and I would see myself. And all the, there was only one thing in my mind, this first thought that came. No! <laughs> Later on, all I can add words to it was, what if it's not me? What if it's not me? The, the final installment of that is where I did get back to Pittsburgh, I actually dropped out of college. Um, I just walked into my mother's and said, so, kid, I'm, I'm just dropping out of college, I'm going to get a job working construction, and, and I just want to do this exact stuff full term. I broke, I broke up with my girlfriend and um, just uh, went full tail boogie for it. But that was how profound that experience that I had. Years later, I read a uh, 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 Still, I mean, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what happened to me. But year, many years later, I was reading a book by Huang Po, <coughs> who's my favorite Zen master of all time. He's Chinese, 800 AD. And uh, he said, Oh, you students of the way. And Zen is called the way. He said, Oh, you students of the way. You fear falling into the void with nothing to stay your fall. But that is ridiculous. There is no void and there is no one to fall. And I never, and to me, that's, I realized when I read that, I said, wow, that's where I was. And I couldn't, I didn't make the, I didn't make the whole trip because I was still too afraid of falling into the void with nothing to stay in my fall. So I'm going to leave it right there for you guys. Um, um, what my, my intentions tonight are very, very simple. I want to, I hope, in some small way, I manage to turn you on. You know, I hope that, that, that my story, I tell this story, or these stories, 
because I'm hoping to act as a burning bush for other people. Rose used to ask all the time, you know, people like me used to say to them, how do I, I mean, thank you. A lot of people, you credit him for saving their lives. They'd say, how can I thank you? Mr. Rose never took a dime, never wanted money, never wanted anything. He lived so simply, you couldn't even, you couldn't even get him anything. And um, you'd ask him, Mr. Rose, what can I do? And every time I ever heard anybody ask that, including myself, he always said the same thing. He said, pass it on. If you've gotten anything out of any of this stuff, he said, pass it on to someone else. So to me, I see my whole life at this point as a, as, a, as a way of trying to pay the debt back that I had to Richard Rose by passing it on, by passing it on to my book. I try to I try to underweave and weave in and out, and I'm thankful that a number of people have picked up on this in my Forbes writing. But I put this stuff between in the you know when I talk about creativity, I throw Zen in there. You know I point out that, that Steve Jobs credited Zen with all his creativity, um, and I'm trying to uh, get it across because this is the most wonderful, most amazing, most spectacular adventure trip. <coughs> Whatever you want to call it, you can engage in. And the final analysis, in my humble opinion, it's all there is. It's like a kid that used to come to our meetings in Cleveland, you know, he's really religious, came to all our meetings. And so he was a kid who was probably 25 at the time. He, he turned to me and I said to him, I said, well, you never miss a meeting. You're here all the time. Why? I got to ask him. He was, you know, I was, well, I got three heads. He said, what do you mean? It's the only game in town. And I want to turn people on. Now, I, I also will say in closing that I do not believe I have persuaded a single person in my life. I've never turned anybody around. I've never argued anybody into any of the point, my points of view. The only thing that I can hope for is there are people in the world that resonate. I gave this talk years ago to Duke, and I'll never forget it was an Asian girl. I was, afterwards I was exhausted and I was drinking water and, and it was, I think it might have been in this room. I was standing over right over there and uh, I was finally by myself and I was drinking water and this, she comes beelining in from the room. She walks over to me and she says, I just want to thank you. She said, everything you said tonight I've known since I was eight years old and I never had the words for it. Thank you. Boom, she runs out the room. So I just, I was, I was grateful, and then I start drinking my water, and shoo, she comes back in. She comes right in front of me, and she says, my name's Mary. <laughs> I never saw Mary again. That's fine. But Mary and I resonated for an hour or so. She already knew. And that, to me, is what I already knew when I met Rose. That's what our friend Neo already knows when he meets Morpheus. 